Thank you, musicians, for your beautiful music to welcome us here to our uh, service this morning. And we'd like, I'd like to welcome you all. It's not often that we have more visitors than regular members. So you visitors that are here and can come back again and again and again, would you keep coming back again and again and again? We do, we do enjoy having you along. Some, I, I, I'm bound to uh, forget some on before I go any further. For those who are watching on TV too, welcome to your screen. And I hope you're comfortable and I hope you enjoy the uh, message that we have today. It's a special day in that we will be dedicating young Joshua Mance uh, to the Lord, which is probably the reason why the back row is full. So it's lovely to see Rob's mum back again, Rena, and uh, Rob's friend, Margaret, is it, or Mugat? My apologies as I'm not pronouncing your name uh, properly. And uh, Nada, good to see you. And then two others have come in too, but welcome. It's good to see you. Here. And then we go to this side over here and we've got another form that's chock-a-block full. And these folk, plus a couple of others, have come up to uh, be with Barry and Ina. And we've got Bronnie and Ross. We've got um, Ross and Amanda and Morgan. My apologies, Morgan, for thinking you the Morgan name was male. I, I get myself into trouble sometimes. You're familiar with the sanitarium triathlete things they do for kids from time to time. I was a, um, I was a, I had to go around asking people questions, what they thought about this thing, you know. Stand at the end of the race, Ken, and grab kids and ask them what they thought about the races. And these two kids pulled up and they looked just like you. And the dad was a bit proudly with them and I said to them, now, girls, would you like to come and answer a few questions? And the dad hit the roof because they weren't girls, they were boys. <laughs> you have to be so... This world is just becoming so complicated for an old man like me, and it's hard to keep up to date. Anyway, Ian and Sonny, good to have you along. Now, Ian and Sonny, we go back a long way. Uh, why he days probably late 80s, I think it must have been, when we were back in Tauranga running VBS up there or holiday, kids' holiday program in Waihe. Love staying at your home, love getting down to the beach, love doing that program. So welcome, it's lovely to have you here too. And then Don and Deanne, good to have you over as well. They, be, because of their accent, which is the same accent as my last secretary at the division, they happen to know my last secretary, so there's a little bit of a connection there. And Bill and Angie, yeah, come to that, and Zena, and yeah. Now, in your in your bulletins this morning, you have that pretty piece of paper, and the lady responsible for that is this lady sitting next to Denise, and her name is Angela. And Angela has a connection with our family too. See, everyone's connected to us. Um, in that uh, she is, um, how do you say it? She's the mother of our son-in-law. Yeah, that's right, eh? That's, that's exactly right. Yes, we share grandchildren, that's, that's right. And last, this time last Sabbath, we were looking after the grandkids, one with nearly a broken nose and the other one with skinned off toes. But anyway, that, that, that's another story. And I'm, I'm proud to say I'm the sister of the pastor. And she's the sister of the pastor as well, all right? So there's quite a few connections there. So to all of you, welcome. And if I have forgotten you, please buttonhole me out here and I'll make up for it. Our offering today is uh, for the Greater Sydney Conference uh, Food Services. Sing along this evening. We'll be over in the pastor's house and that commences at 5 p.m. That's the home just over here. Um, we have a... Uh, a um, dedication happening today. Next Sabbath is a potluck lunch, so please remember that. And once again, visitors, you are more than welcome to enjoy the beautiful food that is always prepared. So that's next Sabbath. Uh, prayer meeting this Wednesday evening at 7.15 here in the church. And then we have a business meeting on the 28th, that's on this Thursday evening, and that commences at 7 p.m. 
All right, um, so please come along for that. that. That's for our members, have your reports ready and so on. And then next Sabbath is, will be a special Sabbath too because we have Pastor Albert Matahiti with us. He is the president of our conference from Sydney and he'll be coming over. If you'd like to have a chat with him, part of, part of the visit is to try and work out the future. Once um, Roger and Denise leave, uh, what, what will happen then? Um, and if you've got some ideas on what you'd like to see happen or, or what could happen, uh, and you'd like to have a chat with him, let me know and I'll put you down for a time so that you can meet with Pastor Matahiti, Pastor Alban. And then, uh, as per your flyer, this Wednesday at 5.15 in the hall here, uh, Angela will be presenting a couple of lectures, just short lectures, one on gut health and immunity and the other one on eating well for health and longevity. Um, and followed by a Q&A session afterwards, so you're all invited to come along for that. And I think that covers pretty much everything. Yeah, thanks, Roger. Thank you so much, Ken. I admire the fact that Ken always manages to create a very warm, welcoming ambience by his uh, announcements. Thank you, Ken, very much. Look, there are a number of folk I think that we don't always thank. Um, Leone, for example, does an amazing job on Friday mornings to make sure this building is clean and neat and just inviting. Thank you, Leone, for doing that so faithfully. And then there are the flowers, you know. Have a look at the flowers this morning. And uh, I think the, the yellow ones here come from your place, don't they? Where are you? Shirley, yeah, thank you very much, Shirley. And, and uh, Denise, you've got these uh, from our place, so thank you, uh, Denise, for putting those together. So there are unnumbered things that make a difference to our service that we'd like to uh, just acknowledge and say thank you to. But folk, it's now time for us to gather our thoughts together, uh, to gather ourselves together, and to come before the Lord in an act of worship. And to that end, I'm going to ask you to stand and together we will read from Psalm 98 responsively to just to lift our thoughts, our hearts and our spirits to our Heavenly Father who loves to come and meet with us by His Spirit. So let's lift our thoughts to Him and uh, we, we, we will sing a prayer after that and, uh, and pray. So I will read and then I'll ask you to read the, uh, the, the ones in black. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained salvation for him. The Lord has gained salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the Lord. The Lord has he has remembered his loving kindness and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And then together. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth, break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Let's sing together this prayer. Son, come to me 
all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Our Father, we've come labored and heavy laden in some respects this morning. But we come to you in response to your, your invitation and ask you, O oh Lord God, to be with us, to let your spirit move among us and to let your words become food to our souls. We pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Um, the first hymn that we have for you all is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We all sing up loud. Just a closer walk with thee.
Let's take time out now to seek our Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, along with David this morning, we wish to say it is good when they said to come to the house of the Lord. So lovely to be with uh, so many friends on this special occasion and to be able to share in song and word with you. And Father, we desire a closer walk with you. We uh, ask that day by day you will help us to take the time out to acquaint ourselves with you and your word and then allow it to direct our paths. This morning, Father, as we uh, come in worship, we have a special um, part of our program uh, for young Joshua. We pray that uh, all of those involved uh, that it will be a special day for them and especially for young Joshua too, Lord. And not only Joshua, but all of the young people that we have here, and we don't have many, but I pray, Father, that uh, you will direct their paths, that you will supply their needs, and that they may grow to love you and to commit their lives to you. We take a look around at this old world of ours, Father, and we recognise Things are unravelling. Situations uh, politically are becoming uh, worse. We think of the folk in the Ukraine, many who will be welcoming in a Sabbath in a few hours' time and will be doing it in very, very difficult situations. I pray, Lord, that you'll draw near to them. And for those, Father, who have been forced or who have chosen to leave their homes and head elsewhere, would you care for their needs? For those, Lord, who are supplying their needs both on a national basis but also on the uh, non-government um, organisation groups too, Lord. I pray, Father, that you may resource them well for the good they are doing, but that their, their kindness and generosity may reach the real needs of these folk who have had to leave their homes. Please watch over them, we pray. Father, we think of those who are not uh, so well today. Some haven't been able to uh, join us. Others are up on uh, Naranda. Pray that you will be with them. We think of Kath today especially. We pray that your presence will uh, draw near to her and that you will uh, bless her today. As Roger shares with us from your word later this morning, Father, I pray please that your spirit will speak through him, that his words may find a resting place in our hearts and that um, in the weeks ahead it may uh, help to guide us as well. And so, Father, we pray that you will shut us in with your presence this morning and we say thank you again for the Sabbath and the rest that it brings. In Jesus' name, amen. Our offering today, as I said before, goes to the Greater Sydney Conference Food Services um, Department. So I'd like the deacons to come forward, please, and uplift our offering. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to return to you our tithes and offerings this morning. As the offerings are used to multiply your work in food services, I pray, Father, that they will be blessed and that everyone who has freely given this morning may be richly blessed by you as well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, I think we've got three children who can come up the front for a story. Sorry to be sitting so far away from you, but that's all right. Now, I want to tell you a story about a mum and a dad who lived in Papua New Guinea. They came from a town called Okapa. But to get to Okapa, it would take you about a week to walk there. Or if you took the aeroplane, that might take you only 10 minutes. But these were a young couple. I don't remember their names, but I did meet the father. And they really wanted a baby boy. But there were no babies being born. So the father said to the mother, we're going to start praying. So every morning and every evening, the father would take his wife's hands in his hand and he would pray. He would pray that God would send them a baby boy. Well, do you know, before very long, the lady fell pregnant. And every evening and every morning, the father would pray and hold his wife close and say, Dear Jesus, this little boy, Luke, he didn't even know it was a little boy. Dear Jesus, this little boy, Luke, I want you to help him grow to be a preacher man, please. He prayed that every morning and every evening, and sure enough, when the baby was born, it was a boy. And the father knew then, yes, God's going to answer my prayer. He named him Luke. Well, every morning and every evening they had family worship and his father would remind his little baby, even as, like this, he was going to be a preacher boy. Well, he grew and he grew and he got to four years old and he started to say to his dad, Daddy, can I preach in the church today? And daddy said, no, you're too small. You're too small. You wait till you're a big boy, then you can be a preacher man. But he kept pre begging and begging. One day when he was si six, Dad got up and he thought, oh, my throat feels sore. <clears throat> and he said to his wife, I can't speak. And he came to the breakfast table and Luke was sitting there and Luke looked up at Daddy and said, what's wrong with you, Dad? I can't speak. And Luke said, will you be able to preach in the church today? And his father said, can I preach? Well, poor old dad, he couldn't say anything because, of course, here was the opportunity that he was waiting for and he said, yes, all right, I'll tell you what to say. No, 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 said Luke, I know what to say. I know what to say. Well, they went to church and when it came time for the church service, everyone looked around at, fa at the father, but he just sat in the seat. And up from the seat went the little boy. Elijah, come up here. Please, come here, quick. Well, stand there. Can you just stand? Because I want the people to see how tall you are. How tall are you? Just stand up. There's the boy. Now, Luke was only that big. And they had to get a chair to stand behind the pulpit so he could see over it to see the people. And there are several hundred people and he preached and he preached and he preached for a whole hour. And the people when they left that service said, it's the best sermon we've ever heard. He kept preaching. Now, Julie and I, we went to a place called Kokoda. It's, it's a very hot place, extremely hot, but it's down at the bottom of this Kokoda mountain. Now, you look at Mount Pitt, and you put 12 mount pits on top of each other, and that's how high these mountains go, way up above the clouds. And do you know, we had a meeting for all the kids in that area, and some boys and girls who are only four years old walked off those mountains. It took them three days to come down to this big, um, what would you call it, fair? Children's camp. There were 500 kids there from the age of four to about 14. Many of them had walked for three or four days to get there. And who was there but Luke? And he was about 10 years old, 12 years old. And every morning and every evening he preached to these 500 kids and I tell you what, could he preach? 
And I've got a video clip of him at home and I couldn't get it up on the screen this morning because my the computer wouldn't read it. But he was he was he was waving his hands and telling stories and he could tell some funny stories. One minute he just about had them crying, next minute they were laughing so hard they were nearly falling off their seats. Then he would tell them he would tell them a Bible story and take a lesson from it. And I spoke to his dad and I said, How come Luke is a preacher boy? Oh, he says, Ken, he said, I prayed for this boy when he was even before he was born that God would give me a preacher man. He said, and there he is. He's our preacher man. God does answer prayers. Now, I don't know what plan God's got for you guys, but I can promise you something. God has a plan for you. King David said in one of his Psalms, before you were even born, God wrote down a plan for your life. And it's in a book in heaven. And if you ask God to tell you what's in that book, he will. But I'll tell you something, everybody has the same back page. Everyone. Because on the back page it says, and I want them to be in heaven with me. I think I'll stop there. You can go sit down. Thank you very, very much, Ken. And what a lovely way to, to lead into this next very special part of our service, which is the dedication of little Joshua Mance. This, I, I mentioned this to somebody before, I think it was John in the back. He said, we haven't had one of these for a long time. <laughs> and I don't know, I haven't been here that long, but I imagine it's been a little while. So we're so delighted. And I know that... Uh, um, Rob and Elby are delighted that you, as their friends and, and church family, have come. You know, one of the precious things about this little church is that it, it thrives on being a family or a community, doesn't it? Lovely. One of the lovely things we like to do uh, is to have our sing-along every now and again in our home, which we're having tonight, and having supper there. You're invited to come and have supper as well. Lovely community things. And uh, one of the lovely things that we can do as a family, as an extended family, is to join a mum and a dad in dedicating their brand new child. Um, before we uh, actually do that, though, I'm going to ask for a, a very special, special item. I'll tell you why this is special. Because this song was sung at the dedication of the little girl who's going to sing it. Come on, Hadessa, where are you? Hadessa and Caleb, come and present this lovely song, I'll Always Be a Child. And 
special was that, eh? Amen. In just a moment, we're going to uh, invite Rob and Elvie and little Joshua to come up to be with me. But before we do that, they've asked uh, Darlene and Gary, two very special friends, to read some scriptures that uh, lay the uh, foundation, set the uh, scene for this. So thank you. This is very special indeed. This is from 1 Samuel 1, 27 and 28. And Hannah replied, I asked the Lord to give me this child and he granted me my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord. second reading comes from Luke chapter 2 verse 22 the time came for Mary and Joseph to do what the law of Moses says a mother is supposed to do after her baby is born they took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem and presented him to the Lord and that's exactly what Rob and Elby have asked to do knowing that the time has come when their child is just old enough to be exposed a little bit to, uh, to public scrutiny, uh, they want to bring their child to dedicate him. And I think he might be just a little bit restless today. Uh, he never is, is he? Never is. He never hears a squeak out of little Joshua. But come on up the front, uh, uh, Rob and Elby. It's been such a pleasure to welcome this young couple into our, into our hearts, into our, our church. And for them to bring their little child has just brought a ray of sunshine, hasn't it? Don't you find that? And uh, let's come over here so you can be more central. There we go. Yeah. Uh, we, you noticed, didn't you, that we read a scripture uh, which said that when Jesus was, had come of age, which was uh, only a few days old, he was taken to the temple by his parents to be dedicated. Uh, that was not a child, that was not an infant baptism. That was simply the parents dedicating the child and themselves to raise that child for God. And when eventually little Joshua comes of age, their prayer will be that he will make a decision to be baptized himself. But this is a day when mum and dad are saying, Oh Lord, you've given us a precious, precious gift. And we want to say thank you for that and we want to dedicate our hearts and our lives and our little boy to you. And I know that's your desire. As I look into your faces this morning, I just, 
I see parental um, joy there. <laughs> There's something about a mother's eyes and a father's eyes, isn't it, when they have a little child, especially at a moment like this that just beams, and you're beaming this morning. And little Joshua, Joshua, you're a, a God-given gift, mate. And uh, just as um, we heard in the story, uh, your parents have prayed for you, and who knows but what God, what God has a very, very special task for little Joshua. So I'd like to pray a, a prayer of dedication. I'd like you to come to be over with me, and I'm going to put my hands on you and on the little baby. He's reaching out to me. See that? that that's a good sign. <laughs> and I'm going to pray and ask that the Lord will richly bless you in your endeavors to raise him in the right way. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I want to say thank you. We all want to say thank you for this precious, precious gift. To see this precious little boy, to feel his fingers reaching out to mine, indicates that you have created in him a little person who is reaching out for the world and for guidance and for lo and longing for love. And Father, we commit this little boy into the uh, into the arms of Elvie and Rob and ask that you will bless them. It's a huge task you've given them, Father, but one we know that you will give them the grace to fulfill. Be every day with them as they guide him, as they discipline him, as they laugh with him, as they cry with him, as they live every moment of their lives with him. Grant, O oh Father, your presence and your wisdom so that they will know how to respond. They will know how to model the, um, the very graces of Jesus. So this little boy will grow up with his face turned to heaven and not away from it. So Father, bless them this morning we pray and honor their commitment to give this little boy back to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a special little gift we would like to give you. And uh, Denise is going to come and bring it to you. This is just a little token from us as a congregation of how much we love you and we want the very, very best for you and for little Joshua. Thank you. So. Rob, I think as dad, you want to say something. <laughs> Elvin, I understand the responsibility given to us in bringing up our son Joshua. And uh, therefore we... Um, oh, sorry. Read that. <laughs> Therefore, we appreciate the um, importance of this dedication service, but we'd also like to say thank you to our church family and the wider community for the love and support you have shown us and look forward to the blessings from God that we will receive through each one of you and being a part of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please stay here because I know that the congregation would like to respond to this. Julie, just lead us, would you, in a little moment of consecration. Come on. Isn't it a, a privilege to have a little baby in our church? We, we pray and pray for children. <laughs> and God gave us one. And I know as a church family, we feel blessed to have your family here, you and little Joshua. And we also want to commit as well in a little prayer that we, I'll offer to say that we're going to do everything we can to have a safe place for him here and to have a, an environment here where he can be growing to be a friend of Jesus and a disciple of his. And we've already had many discussions about children in some of our meetings, but I would ask if you will commit yourself to supporting Joshua as in a spiritual journey, would you stand as I just have a little prayer? Show your support. Please. 
Dear Lord, we stand as a church committed to Joshua, to supporting his parents as a, as a church family, as a, a village, a community here. We pray that you will always keep prompting our hearts as to the best we can do to help this little one grow up, to love you and to serve you as well. We thank you for the blessing of his presence in our church and we commit ourselves to providing the nurture he needs to, we ask in your name. Amen. Can he hang on? We've got a, a lovely little song to, to sing at this moment. I wonder, Lance, would you come up? This is a lovely dedicatory song as well. Just a little medley uh, design just for Joshua. Josh, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong, yes, Jesus loves Josh, yes, Jesus Jesus loves Josh, yes, Jesus loves Josh, for the Bible tells me so. Oh, how he loves Joshua, oh, how he loves you and me. Josh, oh how he loves me, oh how he loves you and me. God bless you guys. Should have put the word sermon at there, shouldn't I? Because the hour is late, but I'm sure we will spend these few moments at least in just some, or of the buildings, but of the people. And one of the most confronting images for me was to see pictures of mums being squirreled away, shepherded away, herded away into underground bunkers to have their babies. It's very confronting because normally in our society, as in theirs, I'm sure, the birth of a child is a beautiful occasion. You go to a, a special birthing suite and you have all sorts of luxuries laid on and you've got people around to help you. These people were not. These mums were thrown into the dungeons, as it were. They were... It was, it was a very demeaning experience. There's something incredibly sad about that, and yet very poignant. It's a little bit like the world we live in, isn't it? A world that is caught up thinking that battles and political events and, 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 and loud noises are what really matter. When history shows, on reflection, that it so often is not the battles, but the babies that are born that make a difference in history. Take the Napoleonic Wars, for example. Back in the early 1800s in Europe, Europe was again being ravaged by, the, by the, the, the cruel ambitions of, of a politician, a leader, Napoleon. 
halfway between the Battle of Trafalgar and the Battle of Waterloo in 1809, there were some babies being born that nobody noticed, but who would change the course of history far more than Napoleon and all his artillery did. In England, the birth, for better or worse, of Charles Darwin. In America, the birth, for much, much better, of Abraham Lincoln. And then in the world of literature, on that very same year, in the middle of the battles that were being war, uh, waged in Europe, there were great men of, of literary worth, people like Oliver Wendell Holmes and Alfred Lord Tennyson. In the music world, Chopin, Mendelssohn, people who have set the, the shape and the tone of the modern world far more than Mr. Napoleon and his soldiery. And yet, strangely, everybody thinks about battles and nobody thinks much about babies. In fact, the task of parenting is a bit like that sometimes, isn't it? The everyday, repetitive, insignificant tasks of raising a little one seem so ordinary compared with the Mr. Scott Morrisons who stand up in, in political rallies or, or the wars that are being, be, uh, being fought. And yet the reality is that there is nothing, nothing, nothing more important than the raising of the little baby. In fact, you will r know, many of you who are familiar, familiar with the book by Ellen White called uh, The Adventist Home, have a quotation like this, that the sphere of the mother and the father may be humble, but their influence is as abiding as eternity. Next to God, Ellen White writes, the parent's power for good is the strongest known on earth. Next to God, the parent's power for good is the strongest known on earth. So what exactly is the goal or the task of the parent? What are they striving to do? Well, I guess if you've asked modern parents, you get as many ans answers to that as you would parents. I mean, some people say, well, I just want them to grow up to be good citizens, and others say, well, I'd just like to them to grow up, grow up and get off my hands kind of stuff. If you were to ask a Jewish mum or dad, the answer would be very clear. Jewish mums and dads acted out every Friday night what their family is about. On Friday night, as the sun is going down in the Orthodox homes, the, the, uh, the father will gather the children and the mother together. And in a beautiful ceremony with candles and with, with breads and, 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 uh, and grape juice, he will bless each one of those children. He will put his hands on them, pray for them, and bestow a blessing on them. In Judaism, there's no doubt what they're about. They're about bestowing a blessing on their children. No wonder the Jewish culture is rooted in the Old Testament, is it not? And over and over in the Old Testament, you have instances of parents or other people bestowing blessing on their children on their families. Oh, to, to receive a blessing in the Old Testament culture is to receive something that is exquisitely prized. You would think of the way, for example, that when Jesus came, you remember the occasion when parents pushed their way into his presence and brought their little ones, and as you remember, they just wanted Jesus to touch and to pray over them, and to bless them. So much was a blessing by an important figure prized by the ancient world. Contrary, or the obverse of that, if you like, is to realize that to be deprived of that blessing 
was a tragedy beyond words. You will remember the story, I'm sure, of Jacob and his birthright. Jacob, Esau, their, their dad, um, Isaac. You will remember the story of how it was time to bestow the birthright on the eldest of the twins, um, Esau. And mum listens to the plans. And she says, I like Jacob better than I like Esau. I want to arrange for the birthright to go to Jacob. And so he's, it's arranged for him to dress up just like his brother, to prepare the meal just like his brother was going to prepare it, and to go in and to steal it. I want you to notice the words that Scripture uses to describe what happened when that happened. Because Esau comes back and he is ready to um, receive the birthright. And it says that when um, that, it, that it, Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who are you? Where's the one who was hunting game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceeding great and bitter cry and said to his father, Father, bless me. Bless me, O oh my father. He goes on to say, but he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And now, look, he has taken away my blessing. Have you not a blessing reserved for me? An unbelievable tragedy in the life of Esau when he realized that he had been deprived of his father's blessing. It's a scenario that is all too familiar in the modern world. How many a youngster grows up into adult life with a largely unconscious awareness that they have never received the blessing of their parents? That somehow the affirmation how much we believe in you, son, how much we love you, my daughter, has never actually rested in their spirits. There's a man by the name of uh, John Trent who knew what that, that pain was about. Grew up as a twin in his home where his dad would hardly ever talk to him. Oh, he gave him everything that was needed to grow up as a decent sort of a kid. He had enough money, enough food, all that sort of stuff. But his dad never told him that he loved him. And then they, their grandparents came to live with them. And uh, the grandfather particularly was a very stern disciplinarian. You didn't get away with anything from that, from that granddad. And he had one particular rule which he enforced in that home. Boys, you can go out and play anywhere you like, but I need you to be home by the time the, the uh, street lights come on. Well, John says, on one occasion my brother and I missed the deadline. And we knew what we were in for. And so he goes down to his grandfather's room, he's beckoned down there, and his grandfather gives him the uh, prescribed cuffs, I suppose you'd call them. He was buffeted for his, for his sins. Um, and as he was going back, his grandmother said, look, uh, John, I wonder if you just go back down there and, and tell Grandpa to come for lunch, come, come, for, come for breakfast, I think it was. Well, it was a dinner, wasn't it? That's right. He was very reluctant to go back, but he did go back. He didn't dare go inside the door because he was taught that you didn't go in. You knocked first, you asked if you could come in, and you always treated Grandpa as Sir. But on this occasion, this little boy noticed that the door was actually just ajar a little bit. He pushed it open. He went inside. He looked, and what he saw startled him. 
Because there, that disciplinarian grandfather was sitting on the edge of his bed, weeping. John had never seen his grandfather weep before. He wondered whatever was the matter. And he was about to run away for fear that he might be in trouble again. When the grandfather said, no, 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 come here, John, come, please come. And he threw his arms around little John. And he said, John, I don't know whether you know it, but it hurts me so much when I have to spank you like that. And I need you to know, Johnny. And he braced him very strongly in his arms. I need you to know that I hope that you and your brother will grow up to be strong young men for the Lord. I hope that more than anything. John Trent grew up to be a psychologist and he realised that parental blessing is indispensable. He said that particular incident made a huge difference on my life. I knew from that day onward that I was really, really somebody special. Parental blessing, that's what parenting is about. Bestowing the gift of parental affirmation. So the question is, as we come to a close this morning, just exactly how is that bestowed? In the Old Testament, it was bestowed ceremonially. You had a little ceremony and it was done formally. But those who study things have looked a little deeper into those stories of, of, um, of uh, blessing in the Old Testament. And they have been able to isolate five different elements or ingredients that make a blessing, a formal blessing, effective in a child's life. The first of these is that blessing was always associated with touch, meaningful touch. You remember the story of Jesus, don't you? And as I look closely at the story of Jesus blessing those children, you know what it says in every one of the three Gospels that talk about it? It says they brought their children in order for Jesus to touch them. Was there something special about Jesus touching children? Is there something irreplaceable about you and I, as parents particularly, touching our children in a way that says you're loved, you're special. <clears throat> Tragically, in this modern world, we live in a time when we have to be extremely careful who touches our children. And that's a tragedy, because kids need affirmative touch. And it needs to be appropriate touch, touch that affirms their manhood or their girlhood and that uh, shows their masculinity or their femininity in appropriate ways. So meaningful touch is a very, very f important part of bestowing blessing. But it needs to be more than that. Touch needs to be accompanied by words. Words of blessing, of affirmation, of love. Now I know that that's kind of difficult for some of us as parents and grandparents and other people. We, to, we, we can say all sorts of things to our kids, but to say meaningfully to them, I love you, son. I think you're going to be a great girl, daughter. To say that meaningfully feels sometimes a little awkward or artificial. And so we put up with saying, well, look, I, it's, it's a blessing that I'm here, isn't it? Without necessarily saying anything. But John Trent, in writing a book about this later on, makes this statement, which I want to read to you. He says, blessing only becomes so when it is spoken. Blessing, parental blessing, only becomes so when it is spoken. I think I know about that. I had the be best dad. Ang Angela and I had the best dad. We were talking about that last night. We did. But dad was a busy man. 
and particularly in my young years, he was often not at home. And I don't often recall him saying to me how valuable I was. So, when it came time for me to leave home and go to college to become a minister, I remember so very well him inviting me to kneel down with him in our lounge room in Warunga. And he knelt down and he put his hands on my shoulders and he prayed the most, the most beautiful prayer, affirming me in my desire to become a minister, asking for God's ongoing blessing on me. And I want to say that years later, when I had become a minister, and when I was actually being ordained as a minister, I asked my dad to do the same thing. And he came, and the moment in that dedicatory poem of most significance to me was the moment that my dad once again kneeled down with me, with the whole congregation, and prayed an incredibly beautiful prayer in which I knew, as I heard him pray to God, that he really, really believed in me. What a blessing. Folks, blessing doesn't become blessing until it is spoken. What particular words do I use? Well, when I say a blessing, I need to do two things. I need, first of all, to convey a high value in those words. The word blessing actually in the Hebrew actually conveys the idea of bowing down in reverence before a person. So that doesn't mean to say that I need to do that before my child. I don't need to bow down. And, but there are ways, are there not, of conveying the fact in my words that I believe that you, my little boy, are incredibly special, valuable with great potential. There are ways of doing that, and that reaches the, the child's soul. Secondly, those words need to portray a bright future. In other words, not only saying, my son, I believe in you, but I can also picture, picture your future. You remember the words of, of Scripture, don't you, where, where the Lord says about us, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And folks, as parents, as grandparents, as, 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 as adults surrounding children, we can do that as well. Love the story of the, um, uh, the Jewish mother who has these two little twin boys that she's um, pushing along in a, uh, a chair, in a pram one day, and she comes around the corner and she sees her friend Sarah, and Sarah says, Cooingly, as, as friends do, oh, they're beautiful little boys, aren't they? What's their names? And Sidel, the mother, says proudly, this is Benny, the, do the, uh, the doctor, and this is Reuben, the lawyer. Now, that might have been going a little bit far, but it was saying, was it not, I believe you're, you you're going to make something of yourself. Oh, my dear friends, how many folk have a tragic memory in the back of their minds of their mum, their dad, saying, you're never going to matter anything. You're just, not going to, you're just not going to make it. You're not worth anything. Folk, blessing comes by words, words of high value, and portraying a bright future. And lastly, it isn't simply meaningful touch and saying words, those things need to be backed up, backed up by active commitment to carry those things through. You know, if you say to your child, I, you know, you're, you've got such good talent, you could be a terrific pianist, and then no, never bother to buy a piano so they can become one. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? We need to be active in the way we commit to making sure that our dream for them comes to something. But you know, there's something more 
the, even these things that is required for, for conveying a parental blessing. And it's very well summed up in this little poem. It's kind of a poem. There it is. That reminds us as parents, as grandparents, as mentors in a, in a church community, that we must be ourselves what we want our children to become. If a child, this poem says, lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If he lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If he lives with shame, he learns to feel guilty. If he lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If he lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns to be confident. If he lives with fairness, he learns justice. If he lives with security, he learns to have faith. If he lives with approval, he learns to like himself. If a child lives with acceptance and friendship, he learns to find love in the world. Meaningful touch. A message spoken that conveys real value and a real f and a bright future and an active commitment to make that happen those are the ways in which our children can emerge from our homes feeling blessed but the only way that can happen my friends is that we ourselves know that we are blessed the only person who can forgive is the person who knows that he has been forgiven and is being forgiven. The only person who can love is the person who knows that the most important person in the entire world loves him. Oh friend, mum and dad over here have committed themselves to becoming the right kind of parents for little Joshua who, who's asleep at this very moment. Folk, let's pray with them and for them that they will stay close to their Lord and their Saviour. Let's do all we can as a church community to lift up Jesus who will fill their hearts and ours with love and acceptance that they can pour on this little boy. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Roger. Let's uh, bring our service to a close now by singing hymn number 655, Happy the Home.
Let me pray over you the blessing of Aaron. The Lord said, this is the way you shall bless the children. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.